So uh, continuing with electromagnetic radiation, one thing to keep in mind is that prior to the 1900s, light was modeled almost exclusively as a wave. And for the most part, it worked. Uh, people were able to understand what was going on there with light. But some new experiments showed that light could be better modeled as a particle. So uh, one of those was what's known as the photoelectric effect. Now I'm not gonna go into detail on what was going on with the photoelectric effect, but the basic idea was that if I had some metal surface and I shined light on it, so I got light shining on here, it would eject electrons. And we could look at the kinetic energy of those electrons as they moved, and we can also vary the wavelength of, or the frequency of light and see what that ha impact it had on the electrons that were being ejected. So that, that um, experimental results right there showed us that um, light didn't always get best modeled as a wave, and it also showed us that there were some interesting things going on in the interaction between matter and light. And so this is at the turn of the 20th century. And another are what's known as the double slit experiments where we saw interesting interference patterns when we sent beams of light through multiple slits. And again, that was telling us something about how light seems to be behaving. Another thing that was uh, sort of proposed at the time is that when something absorbs energy, gets a whole lot of energy, and then it sort of emits energy like a black body radiator, it would do so continuously. Okay. So all the light that it, all the energy it absorbed would be given off in this sort of smooth and continuous fashion. Now, the results from the photoelectric effect showed us that that doesn't seem to be quite so true. The idea here would be that whatever it did absorbed this energy absorbed all different kinds of energy and gave it back slowly over time. If we were to blow up just a portion of this to see what it really looked like, it turns out that energy was being lost in these small packets. It was not continuous, it was stepwise. So energy was being given off in these very small steps. And um, this was something that was, uh, was starting to be observed. And so the whole idea and the very principal um, thing for us to remember here is that energy is discrete which means it comes in small packets, which we often refer to as quanta. So another thing we can say is that energy is quantized. All right, so that's an important concept for us to remember. So an equation was developed to describe this, and H here is what's known as Planck's constant. And I, I want to say there's a C in there, but I can't be 100% sure, so I'm going to do a quick check to see. There is. I knew it. Planck's constant. And Planck's constant H has a value of 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. An incredibly small number, vanishingly small, 10 to the minus 34. So the steps that we were seeing here in this stepwise release of energy were incredibly small steps. So no wonder people thought that energy was being lost continuously because the steps were kind of too small to really observe. But as we were able to do more experiments and learn more things, we could start to observe them. So we had this new equation that Einstein helped propose that the energy that's being gained or lost is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the energy being given off. So, um, that works out well there. So what we can do is we can say that the frequency here, well, we sort of know an equation for this. It's C over lambda, just a rearrangement of, um, you know, lambda times nu equals C. So if we were to plug this in for this value here, we can say that E is equal to HC over lambda. So now we've got a new relationship that has energy and lambda in it. And basically, if we have a high value of lambda, that means that the denominator here is big, so that means we're gonna have a low value of energy. So these two, again, would be inversely proportional. So uh, we can use this to answer some more problems. So what is the frequency and energy of, of uh, light with this wavelength, 11, uh, 1142 nanometers? 
So the way we could set this up, we can solve either one of these first. Let's do frequency. So frequency is equal to C over lambda, 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second over 1142 times 10 to the uh, negative nine meters. And that comes out to 2.63 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds or hertz. And then we can take that number and plug it into E equals H times nu. So 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 times 2.63 times 10 to the 14th. And when we put those into the calculator, we end up getting 1.74 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So we've calculated a frequency and we've calculated an energy to go along with that. We can do the same thing with wavelength and frequency. So what is the wavelength and frequency of light with this amount of energy associated with it? Well, we can go about this in a couple of ways. Let's get the wavelength first, and we'll use this equation to do it. So energy is equal to hc over lambda. So 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, all over lambda, which we're trying to get, and that's equal to this energy, 5.89 times 10 to the minus 19. So all we need to do is multiply, <coughs> multiply both sides by lambda, divide both sides by this, and we get a lambda of 3.37 times 10 to the minus seven, meters, and if you want to express that in nanometers, multiplying that by 10 to the ninth, or dividing by 10 to the minus nine, I should say, this comes out to 337 nanometers. All right, so once we have that wavelength, we can also get its frequency, but we can use our original, which is always a good idea, to figure it out. So energy equals H times nu. So nu is equal to energy divided by H, so 5.89 times 10 to the minus 19 over 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. And that will give us a frequency, 8.89 times 10 to the 14th. Interestingly enough, this corresponds to something that is just shy of visible light. Visible light tends to go from about 400 to 800 nanometers. So this is just shy of that in the um, near UV portion. Okay, so that's an example of some of the problems that we could see there. Uh, in the next little bit, we'll go over how this turned into a new model of um, looking at atoms using quantum mechanics.